Hi folks, good morning and you are very welcome to this week's Genos Live. If you were on just before the countdown started or just as the countdown started, you probably saw a little hiccup where I hit the wrong button and actually terminated the session before it started. And it was just, it's just one of those mornings when we had about 60 or 70 seconds of technical hiccups that really challenge your ability to just keep your feet planted on the ground. But I'm delighted to say all of the tech is, uh, is working now. So you're very welcome to uh, this week's session with Professor David Clutterbuck and we're going to get uh, and introduce David in just a couple of minutes. Uh, uh, David is the author as you'll hear in a short while of uh, I believe as of yesterday and I'll double check with this uh, this one I believe he finished his 75th book in time for his 75th birthday. Um, one of the ones that I particularly like is the one that's on your screen there um, coaching uh, the team at work and I was just looking this morning and I said See that it is an incredible uh, steal on Amazon at four ninety five on Kindle. Um, not so inexpensive on the in the hard copy version, but a really really great book if you have anything to do with uh, teams or coaching teams. So you're very welcome. As as is kind of if you want to call it traditional. Uh, with us on this session, please pop into the chat and just tell us where you're dialing in from. And because uh, David is going to talk today about a perennial problem, and that is the problem of change and the crippling effects of change, I'm just curious to know um, for you, either as internal coaches, consultants, trainers, professional leaders, etc., or external coaches, uh, consultants, and trainers, what's the biggest challenge that you're seeing people having? post-pandemic. David's going to talk about the perennial challenge of uh, change, as I say, in just a few moments. So pop that in. Uh, Aoife is not with us this morning, and I am delighted in a few moments I'm going to welcome uh, Kira Aspinall, who has stepped into the breach, and I'll introduce Kira in just a moment. Let me quickly tell you about Genos International. Um, if you've been here before, you've heard this before, but you know it only takes about 30 or 40 seconds. And uh, Genos International are an emotional intelligence organization. We specialize in the development and publishing of emotional intelligence assessments and training and development programs in emotional intelligence, psychological safety, and uh, resilience. Uh, we uh, also certify uh, coaches, consultants, trainers, and in-house professionals to do what we do with our tools. So we certify them as uh, certified emotional intelligence uh, practitioners. And we must be good at what we do because for the last five years, we've been one of trainingindustry.com's top five assessment companies in the world. And one of the things that makes us most proud is when they cite why we're one of the top five, they always talk about one, the innovation, and two, about the uh, level of service and support we give to our customers and partners. So that's a little bit about who we are. We do a lot of different programs, and usually each week I just tell you a couple of minutes about one that's going on right now. This one is uh, one that's become very, very popular over the last uh, six or seven months, uh, particularly, and that is a program to equip uh, leaders to have coaching conversations, not to turn lead leaders into coaches, but to give them the skills to be able to have more effective coaching uh, conversations with their people. If that's a topic for you right now, just drop us a line on eu at genosinternational.com uh, uh, and we can give you full details of that program. Um, before I go on to Professor Clutterbuck, let me tell you that next week we have um, uh, Dr. Amanda Blake and she's going to be talking about embodied self-awareness and her research in that area. She's the author of Your Body is Your Brain, uh, one of the, the seminal works in, in this area of sort of somatic self-awareness. And uh, just so you know, for anybody who attends next week's session, she's actually offering uh, free access to a seven-day program uh, on uh, centering uh, and centering yourself. So I, I think really, really fascinating session coming up. If you want to uh, come along to that, if you're already on our subscription list, on our reminder list, well then um, you'll get a reminder for it. If not, just hold your camera over the um, QR code and it'll uh, allow you to go in and register for that. But we'll, we'll give you more details on that before the end and we will post the link to uh, the registration for that in the chat afterwards. Um, th David is the latest in a, a line of really top class speakers that we have with us uh, this year and um, over the next uh, few weeks up to the end uh, of 2022. Now, 
as we go into the summer, we're starting to look at what do we want to be doing uh, with the program moving forward from uh, the end of 2022 onwards. So we'd re always be interested, and you can pop it in the chat, who have you read or who have you heard speaking who particularly impressed you recently on any topics to do with how people show up, bringing them together, uh, making them more effective working together, uh, because those are the folks that we want to have on here. So if you have any ideas for us, please pop those in there. I'm going to bring David in, but just last thing before I do, I'm going to invite Kira in to uh, tell us exactly what have you said to us in the chat. So here we go. Kira, you're on. And first off, let me thank you very much for stepping into the breach with um, uh, AFA out today. Kira is the founder and CEO of uh, Pinpointing Potential, who are a certified practitioner uh, for profiles, and, and she specializes very, very much in uh, emotional intelligence leader training. So, uh, Kira, you're very welcome. What are folks saying to us this morning? Thank you so much for having me. So it looks like we've got a wonderful variety of people joining us today from all over. We've got people joining us from Switzerland, Vietnam, Hong Kong, all over the UK, um, Spain, Italy. So there's a few um, issues that people are um, mentioning here in the chat. For David, he said that the biggest challenge I see is the discomfort and the amount of uncertainty and speed of change going on in the world mm. and how leaders can change can lead this change in this book environment which i think is a really good one mm. other ones that are coming in here are things like team connectedness that's oh. also a real challenge as well and one that keeps coming up too yeah great thank you for that kira and and i, I can actually see dave and david in the background i'm about to bring it and he's nodding his head as you're saying that and you're really playing to the choir when you talk about those topics you know team connectedness and so on and so forth with that said uh let me bring david in and you're very welcome david thank you thank you thank you uh for being with thank us you. here this morning brilliant okay thank you D derek uh, uh yeah, it's, 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 I think this is one. This is a fascinating area. I hope you can see the slides about uh, which. Uh, not through. yet, because we're going. We're going to do a formal introduction to who you are first. We're going to tell them okay. all the wonderful things you are. So, um, okay, before great. we do that, David, over to you, Kira. Brilliant, thank you. So it's an honour and a privilege for me to introduce Professor Clutterbuck today, who is an author, a management thinker, a conference speaker, a workshop presenter, researcher, and occasional comedian. He's also a distinguished principal research fellow in human capital at the conference board and co-founder of the European Mentoring and Coaching Council, or EMCC. He leads a global network of trainer consultant researchers at Coaching and Mentoring International. He's one of Europe's most prolific and well-known management writers and thinkers. He's currently working to complete his 70th book in time for his 70th birthday later this year. And we're honored to have worked with David in the past and to welcome him here today to Janos Live to speak to us on how to avoid corporate arthritis. David, you're very welcome. Thank you. You've just taken five books and five years off my life. And I think that's magic. I love it. Hey, before we before we dive into the formal presentation, just on that topic, David, 75 books in, in 75 years, I would bet that everybody who is on this uh, call uh, feels they have a book in them, but most of us never get around to writing it. What, what would be your recommendation to somebody who feels they have a book in them? How, how do you get started? Or how, how the hell do you do 75 books in even in 175 years, never mind 75 years? Well, I, I did start as a journalist, and my mentor was Peter Drucker for a while. So I, 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 I role modelled myself on, on, on him. But I, I'll tell you what, I'll, I'll, an unexpected additional gift for any, everybody on the webinar. We have an e-book called, which, because so many people ask me that question, how do you write a book? How do you write a book? So we wrote an e-book on how to write your first book. So if anybody wants to connect with, to, to, to send the invitation, uh, either through, through Derek or, or, or directly to me, just, just say, you know, we're on the webinar um, and we will send you a free copy of How to Write Your First Book. Wow, thank you very much, David. That's that's great. And, and folks, if you if you want to get that, just post uh, just post a message into the chat, and we'll reach back out to you and uh, get that link from David because this is a, a spontaneous act of gener generosity on David's uh, part. He didn't know that question was coming up. So it's, uh, thanks a million, David. So so David's going to give us about 20, 25 minutes or thereabouts um, uh, on the topic of uh, corporate uh, how to avoid corporate arthritis. Please, please, please. This is all about 
answering your questions. So as David's speaking, please pop them in. Uh, Kira is going to disappear off and uh, be monitoring the questions. And my head will pop back in every so often when I've got a when we've got a couple of questions from the audience, David. So I'm going to turn it over to you. And um, yeah, off you go. Let's, Let's make sure okay. you get some slides. Here we go. Okay, and okay. not yet. Rock and roll. There you go. Brilliant. So there we go. How to organize, how to, how to avoid organizational arthritis. I, we did a piece of research earlier this year where we interviewed HR directors across Europe um, um, about some of the, the leadership challenges. And one of them privately told me 70% um, of our top 200 are no longer capable of dealing with the complexity of the roles that they have. Things are moving too fast for them. Um, that's pretty scary. Um, and I've just got a few figures up here that, show me, that I'll just skim through because they're just, just a sample of what we, of what we see. Um, <clears throat> you know, the, the number of small businesses in, in 2015 that died, it was bigger in the States, was bigger than the number that were actually created. Now it balances up over the years, <clears throat> but basically most businesses fail. Um, uh, and, and, and over 50% over in their first five years, according to, to, to Fortune. Um, um, and and so forth. When we look at projects, so many projects we've all seen in, in, in every country, we see massive IT projects that cost a bomb and then have to be scrapped because they don't deliver what they should deliver. We're seeing that, that, that essentially in this world that's volatile, uncer uncertain, complex and ambiguous, that we have to replace that somehow with, and this comes from, uh, comes from an organization called VUCA World, which I think is a lovely vision, understanding, clarity, and adaptability and agility. And it's that agility that, that, that we have to look at because organizations naturally go towards, uh, towards getting old immature, uh, and, and mature. Um, uh, a wonderful study on high growth companies from Sweden many years ago found that the one, the key, one of the key points was when the entrepreneur handed over to professional managers from outside and then the organization became like every other organization and it then started to creak and groan and get those pains in the back that we all experience as we get older. And so what we mean by organizational agility is that it's the ability of the organization to, to respond quickly and effectively and appropriately in terms of evolving its purpose, its strategy, its structure and the resources, both you know, how it manages the internal and external resources that it has. Um, and a lot, one, one, in some of the other studies that we've done over the years, we looked at HR systems, for example. And what we found was that many of HR systems actually create organizational arthritis. They are not part of the solution, they're part of the problem um, in terms of particularly succession planning and talent management. Um, so how do we actually get, get around this? How do we manage all these? Well, for purposes about the vision, the mission, the overarching goals, we constantly need to start, keep asking ourselves, what are we here for? Because what we're here for changes um, and, that, and changes faster and faster as the context in which we operate and the permission we have to operate evolves. When we look at strategy too, you know, it, it's um, this, this MIT Sloan study. Uh, look at the, the, the uh, uh, 124 organizations, 20% or 28% of them, only, or only 28% could list three of their company's strategic priorities. I was doing a coaching supervision session yesterday and somebody told me she, there were 10 members on the executive. She had asked all of them what were the strategic priorities for, for, for the business and she said she got between 3 and 10 and no agreement on anything. Um, this is not unusual. If we're not all aligned, then that, then that, 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 that creep of, 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 mis, of wasted effort creates organizational arthritis. And then the structure, we, we've, got, we, we, we've got painful structures um, um, and that don't change fast enough. Succession plans is a great example of this. Most succession plans get thrown away within two or three years. Um, but what they do is, to tend, is tend to slow everything down. Because if people know that they're slow to, slated for a particular job, um, they tend to work to, to actually grow or, or, or put less effort into their own development. Um, and one of the things that, that, that we, um, that I find really helpful. We've got a new, we've got a, a, a vacancy. Do we say who could fill that vacancy and be like the person that was there before? Or do we say who could transform that job role? And these are, these are the kinds of shifts of thinking 
um, that we need to have. How do we change our structures fast enough to accommodate the changes that are happening around us? Um, and then the resources. Do we need to have them in-house or do we have them um, out of or do we need them out of house? How do we define our resources? Because what if, what's a key resource today may not be tomorrow. So how are we monitoring and looking at what are the resources this organization needs to deliver everything? And then we've got all the, those stakeholders and influences. You know, how do we relate to those? A fascinating example for me. There's a company really is struggling during COVID with the advent of COVID. <clears throat> Went out to its customers and its suppliers and instead of and, and, and ask them, how are you struggling? What are the challenges that you're facing? And then they said, and they were able together to come up with some strategies to work with their whole chain to reduce the impact on everybody. They told me afterwards that, as, as, that now they have relationships with some of those customers and suppliers that, they're, that, 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 those, that those customers and suppliers are telling them about the innovations, the changes and uh, that their competitors are making. Um, and so they're getting um, amazing in market intelligence now because they've actually created that agility of the system, not just of their individual organization. Um, and I think this is uh, Tony Llewellyn, uh, a, a great author and, and, uh, um, uh, and practitioner in, 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 uh, in large scale, large project coaching. Um, and it's a lovely quote. If you're going to be dependent on another team's performance to be able to deliver your part of a program or work stream, you need to understand as much as you can about their cap capability and capacity. So we, we, it's, it's bridging, the, bridging the space between teams in organizations is becoming a, a, another big area. We, we talk about flocking. When you see a school of fish or, 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 uh, or, or a flock of birds, how do they all know to shift direction in the same way? You do that with a bunch of people and you do in St. John's Ambulance or, or, or the, the local hospital will be picking the bodies up fairly quickly. It's, it, and what they do, they, 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 have to, they, they keep maintain the separate, same separation. They're always steering towards an average where everybody else is going and they always keep exactly the same distance apart from each other. How do we replicate that in organizations? And that's what we've been studying um, for in, 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 in recent years. And so one of the things we found is, is that, they, that what you can do is to link teams through informal sub teams to go away from the formal hierarchy. And so looking at the vision, how does, what, how does the way that team A interprets the vision in say, let's say it's marketing, affect the way, affect um, the ability of team B, let's say finance, to do its job and vice versa. <clears throat> so looking at how the vision's interpreted throughout the organization and getting alignment. Um, things that get invented in one area of the business, how quickly do they get, 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 they get passed to other bits of the business? We've got case studies that have been found of things <clears throat> being invented in one place in a, in a, in a, in a business, go, being, being taken out by, by, one of the, by a staff member who's left, going to a competitor, going around the world and eventually coming back into the same, com same company um, through a consultancy outside. Can we really afford that, that sort of wastage and loss? Um, the way that we move resources around, do people hang on to their resources or do they share them across, to, according to the need within the, the organization? Do we, um, uh, do, we, do we actually find out this, the, the, the little things that happen um, in, a, in a bank in Ireland, we, 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 we identified that you, people would come in, customers come in with, a, with, with an issue that's unusual. Um, and it would be noted, but nobody would nobody take any, any particular notice of it. Um, it would get passed up through the chain one way or another. But supposing people are coming into lots of branches and just you know, one or two people with, that sim with a similar issue. You've got a trend here, but how do you notice that trend? And creating sub teams of, the, of, 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 of being aware of the abnormal, sharing the abnormal between teams, that's a great, a, a great area. And then voice how people um, who aren't normally heard come together. Me too is a great example of this. Um, and just restructuring as we need to, um, not restructuring with a top down siloed approach, but just informal restructuring that then becomes formal because it's approved and it's working. So these are some of the ways that we've been able to find. We, we have in all of this to see the system as a whole and to get away from linear thinking. Most managers see things as problems and solutions. That's not good enough. We when, when we're doing team coaching, one of the things we find almost never 
when somebody says the problem is, the problem we need to address is x it's never the problem it's a symptom of other issues that are going on behind the scenes and so if we if we focus on linear solutions if we, we they tend to be quick fixes they address symptoms they um they actually usually create more problems in the lo in, in the long term um and yet they can have all sorts of unexpected impacts like paper plastic wrapping wonderful thing but look at the pollution we never thought about that and of course if you if you're distanced from it it's not my problem i didn't create it somebody else did so allocating responsibility for the wave effects the ripple effects of everything that you do being at, is, is, an, is, is important at an organizational level and, and at an individual team level i like this word we invented back in the 19 early 1990s simplexity the art of making complex situations simple but not simplistic that's one of the keys to overcoming organizational um, rigidity i mean we've already said that one of the in hr one of the big problems <coughs> is that systems we have are primarily linear systems you put the money in the in the in the in, in the machine you press the button and out comes your cup of coffee or whatever it is you ordered um although it is it has been said that the, the that some um, change change is inevitable except from a coffee machine um so we, we that but these linear approaches don't work not in the long term so all people are evolving organizations are evolving we need a systemic uh, a complex adaptive systemic perspective on people development aligned with organizational development and again this is one of the ways we get around um, organizational uh, arthritis and so what we need is a rapid learning culture and these are some of the things you'd find in it so a lot of sharing knowledge um, a lot of challenging of assumptions um, re-looking at old solutions because the context has changed maybe the solution is the right one even though it wasn't at me previously using new newcomers to, to question everything the emperor's cl cl you know, new clothes um, newcomers see a lot um, how do we make massive and effective use of that um, making team agendas have not just performance goals but learning goals for every for, for every team meeting these are these and, and valuing mistakes and failures using the, seeing them as experiments um, lots of post action reviews and creating psychological safety these are all key things that, are, that underpin a rapid learning culture and the, we've all seen so much more work in recently in, in what we do in creating psychological safety and we're beginning to understand <clears throat> how you can do it and the style of leadership that creates that and that psychologically unsafe environments are, are very late, very prone to becoming rigid and, and, and because this fear creates rigidity. You seize up with fear. That's what's happening in organizations that don't have high psychological safety. And so these are just some of the rules that, 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 uh, that we have. And I'm not going to read them all out because you're going to get the slideshow anyway. But um, you know, the key thing is that team are all committed to learning together. Or you could say the organization is all committed to learning together um, and one of the things that we found is to, to balance those tasks and learning goals we we we, we get everybody in, in our managers encourage their direct reports to set these specific goals learning goals for the next one month three months and 12 months and then they share them with everybody else and that includes the manager too um, and then they discuss their learning objectives and then you ask each other for help and support so you can share learning you can do a little bit of coaching for each other for example um and then you put you give learning goals in somebody's uh, in, in somebody's uh, uh, um, appraisals and, and 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 in the team meetings you give learning goals equal importance to performance goals it's one of the ways that we can actually help people to keep moving and raise that pace of the learning after all you know if we're not evolving and learning faster than the environment around us we're falling behind um, and that's the danger another key issue that I'll just refer to briefly is, is ethicality there is <coughs> massive literature tell us now that 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 unethical workplaces or place uh, workplaces which are not which are not um, making real use of people's values and applying people's values in an ethical way they get in the way of, of organizational effectiveness dramatically and you can see it reduces productivity, increases fraud, it increases turnover. And this comes from the Joseph, uh, Josephson Institute of Ethics uh, study that they did there. And look at this, organizational politics 
causes uh, is the main cause of employee stress, which causes the United States over a hundred billion dollars loss annually. That's a lot of money. You can pay you can pay for an awful lot of paracetamol. If you've if you've re been reading the Times today, you see that um, 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 that uh, uh, that that some some of the uh, common treatments for for for, um, for back pain are actually making things worse. But if you but 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 paracetamol apparently to be, it seems to be okay. So here, where's the organizational paracetamol here? Um, and you can see you know in, in, in this study by Adam Grant in his book The Originals, yeah. Um, the more frequently employees voice concerns and ideas upward, the less likely they were to receive raises and promotions. So what do you do? You don't raise issues. You let somebody else do it. You let the problem happen. And again, you, you're getting, you're shrinking, you're becoming more and more arthritic as an organization. So we have, need to help people become politically aware and, 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 and adept, but they don't necessarily need to behave politically. And in a book project we have at the moment, we've just developed a whole questionnaire to help people understand their own um, political astuteness. Uh, and I'm happy for any, if anybody, again, uh, would like to, to, um, to play with that and trial that, that, that questionnaire for, out for themselves, you, please do. You, you'd be very welcome to do that. So think politically, act with integrity. That's the key. Um, and I love this quote, people make things happen. If they're not given the autonomy to make things happen within the confines of their existing organization, they'll find somewhere else to do it. A major cause of organizational arthritis is the people who are most innovative, the people who most at once are capable of making change happen. If they are not loved, they'll go somewhere else. And it's, it, what, what, is, what is the state of the drain, the, 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 the creativity drain? from your organization is a great question to ask. So what we've learned is it's important to create coaching cultures inside teams. And um, we've, um, and Derek was just referring to the, to the leader as coach. We, we, what we found is that, is that in, it's really important to, to, to reinforce that, <clears throat> that, that whole process by changing the system. So because the line manager, it's like doing the tango, uh, the line manager and the team, um, they, 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 they're doing a dance together. Um, but if only one of them knows the steps, you've got a problem. So educating the, the team as in, in how to be coached and how to, to, to nurture the coaching culture between them, giving them co-responsibility for it, seems to be a fundamental thing. Um, and so, and the learning, and, 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 and so, and the learning that they take, learning to coach by applying the coaching principles to the real teams and the real, to the real issues and the real meetings that they have. This is all um, important and we the, all the work we're doing around team coaching tells us that if you're just being a team leader you focus on doing on deciding on coordinating if you're going to be a team coach and that can be the same person as a team leader you you have a reflection uh, focus as well on reflection on awareness both self-awareness and everybody else being aware, um, another awareness and using insight to create generate change if we're just doing, deciding, coordinating, and not reflecting, creating awareness, again, we're in deep danger of organizational arthritis. And so some of the things to help the team leader take that systemic view, um, we want them to, to um, uh, basically to look at the interdependencies within the team. Um, and the, the various stakeholders within the, within the team, what, what, what interdependencies between them, listening to the voice of the system around you, um, and so forth. So getting that systemic perspective is really important. Um, but it's something that we don't necessarily spend a lot of time teaching managers to do. We teach managers, managers to solve problems within their own narrow confines, but not to solve problems across the system. Um, and that's, um, and so some of the other things very briefly, um, we, we've got uh, the whole issues of, um, um, of, of diversity, we know that high diversity accompanied by, by, by processes and values that, re, that really do, do um, what, that value that diversity, um, make people feel that they belong and they have a great deal to, to, to contribute. Um, that's, that, that contributes to, high, to a high level of agility. But, but when, you've, when you've got tribal thinking, it, it, it basically undermines agility dr dramatically. Uh, because tribal thinking screams out any ideas that we didn't invent, um, um, but puts, pre prevents people from putting forward ideas because they know they're not, not going to be listened to. 
And so we want to encourage diversity in, in multiple forms. Um, and some of the, one of those forms is, uh, is, is how we think. There's also culture and there's experience and, and expertise. Um, so they're just some of the ways in which we, we, we want to create diversity. And then to, towards the end, um, we see all this stuff. Um, we're all familiar with forming, storming, norming to performing. And I love this word. Somebody said, who the heck's got the time for all that stuff? Our teams have got to hit the ground running. And, you know, all of this stuff, um, this, 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 this Tuckman model, it, uh, in one study from the States, it found that only two teams, or 2% of teams, in a massive study, actual or new teams, actually fo followed that, that process. The, major the majority of them would do, did something completely different. What we're learning is effective coaching can actually help a new team go straight through to performing, or pretty quickly to performing. Um, but what you have to do is to is to make sure that that you are that you are clear about um, how that coaching is, or what the coaching is there for, what the team is there is there for, and and what everybody brings everybody is bringing and contributing to it. So it's the quality of the conversations that happens in that in, in that initial um, um, stage that means that you can skip all that storming stuff um, and go from basically from forming to performing. We're seeing this 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 is as as, as a uh, an important part. Um, we have to um, to forget things like like these obsolete models, which were actually not never done on teams anyway. They were they were created on bunches of people, uh, groups of people in um, uh, patients in therapy um, for depression, um, that's, and, and other and other problems. So that, that's not a great way to, to um, analogy for a team. So all of these things, if we're going to create a team, we have we we can we can um, we put our research around this has shown that there are. There are four or five stages here. Um, we, we, when, we, when we set up the team, we've, what's our permission to operate? What are the resources we need? Have we got the right people? Have we got the right equipment and finances and so forth? Then we form, we come together, we form, we develop our shared purpose, we develop shared relationships, good relationships. Then we focus on the task. What are the processes we need? The knowledge. How are we going to distribute authority, accountability and leadership? And once we've done those, we can start to get on with things and then look at how we can learn collectively. So you get deeper into the processes and you realign with the shareholders just to make sure, or stakeholders rather, making sure that you're really doing what they need you to do. Um, and you, you develop your, your ability to manage both the successes um, and, and the setbacks and to learn from them. And then you can go back into it at any point. So we're finding this whole process of, 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 of rapid teaming. Um, is is something that we, 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 we are continuing to experiment with and explore. And I think it's going to be one of the big themes of the next few years. And it's certainly essential if you're going to have an agile organization. You cannot afford to hang around for hours or, 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 or months while a team gets itself together anymore. And finally, I just want to say something about um, the, the, the whole issue of, um, of agile. We hear the word agile and it, and it basically is, a, is applied to um, to project teams, and particularly the creation of new software um, um, or new technology, <clears throat> um, and it's, it can be extremely effective. But we can apply the same principles to uh, to, to business business to teams that are working as usual. So the normal team, the marketing team, the uh, the finance team, the the executive team. We can apply these things or the same principles um, uh, to to ordinary teams. Um, but not in the but in a very in very different ways, um, and some of the things that we've been looking at at here, um, we, we, um, basically we can take these are the principles we can we can apply that we can take from from agile, but then we add to it um, a number of, of additional ingredients, and one of the most important for for, for, for me is a team development plan. Where the, which, which bridges the gap between individual per, uh, personal development plans and the business plan. But the other one is to, is to basically put the ownership of um, a performance management in, back into the hands of the individual. So instead of having their, uh, their reg, reg, yearly or, or quarterly uh, meeting with their, with their manager to talk about uh, their performance, which everybody hates and many organizations have actually started to throw away as a, as a non-functional non um, activity. 
um, they are responsible for going round to all of their stakeholders and getting the information from them about you know, what went well, what went, went less well, and, and to set for themselves every six weeks some task goals and some learning goals, and their manager coaches them through how they're going to achieve those. It's a very different way of thinking about it, but it's one of the one one of the, a number of ways in which we've been we've been uh, learning that you can actually take the principles of agile into normal team functioning. So I've covered a lot of ground there. I am, uh, but it's it, it, to give you a feeling for some of the research we're doing, some of the experimentation we're doing. Um, would love to hear your thoughts, uh, criticisms, uh, and um, anything else you want to say. Thank you, David. And, and I always realize, and, and you've been very gracious uh, in the past in giving us your time, and I always realize when we're doing uh, these, uh, these sessions that it's so unfair that attention spans are so short that these seminars and webinars get shorter and shorter because we're trying to cram a gallon into a half pint pot. And it's just so much value in there. In fact, I, I, I thought I'll come up with one or two questions. There are several pages of them for me. But um, my questions are, are secondary to the folks out there in chat land. So, uh, Kira, what, what are we getting in on the chat for David? Yeah, we've got um, quite a few questions in here. Um, there is one from David uh, that says, your ideas require leaders working at the third level of Kohlberg's moral of ethical reasoning. How often do you run leadership teams that work at this level? <laughs> we f we're finding that they are bec becoming more common, but they are still relatively uncommon. Yeah. I think that, that's, a yeah. good, that's a good politi a politically appropriate way of talking about it. What is your perspective on the value of the theory of person organization fit of Christoph with the organization psychology in relation to agility and diversity instead of tribals these days? That's a big one. Mm, that is a big one. Well, I think let's just put it into context. Um, if people are evolving and organizations are, are evolving, then, 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 the, then, then, then sometimes they're going to be able to mesh together very, very neatly and other times not. One of the things we have to get away from, uh, I think, in organisation, is this tradition that you you, you put somebody into into a job spot and they, they they appear to be to be just the right person for that job and it's great, and then for a couple of years they work there and they're, they're a great success, but then the needs of the job change, and what do we do? We performance manage them to try and set, reshape them and reset them to, to the to the new to the new requirements. What we should be doing. Is, saying okay so how do we actually use those talents of that person where else can we can we shift them how do we change their job role so that it meets the, 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 the strengths that they have uh, but what we're doing is we're basically taking really successful people and turning them into failures hmm. Hmm. just david something happened with your mic there and it's just gone a little bit lower and a little bit it it did, did it move Obviously. or something no, I don't think so. Oh, there you I'll, go. I'll, there you go. I don't, it might have been a distance. It just just went a little bit quiet. Thank you. Sorry. Sorry about that. Kira, back to you. Um, yeah, so think, let me see. We've got more questions just coming in here. Um, Derek, do you want to ask one of yours there if you've got so many? And I will get more up here as well. Yeah, I, I tell you, Dave, the one the, the, the one that really jumped out at me and just because of, of what we're doing right now was uh, you said that that uh, organizations need to make learning goals equally important to the performance goals. I'm just wondering, are you seeing people doing that? And if they are, how are they actually practically implementing that? Because we, we know how to incentivize performance goals. I'm just wondering, how, how do you do that in practice? Well, at the team level, we can do this through the team development plan. Okay. So, so we yeah. So you you've got once you've got a plan and you review it on a re on a regular basis, it's part of your your agenda. So, yeah, what was the learning that we needed to acquire? Um, how are we how are we going to do it? Um, and and that means also what, what experiments we're going to do to, in, in terms of the way that we work. Um, then then we we can see clearly um, just in the same way as we would any other task project. All right, right, and and I'm just wondering is is that something I, I can imagine that there are people on this call. The fact that they're they're actually on this call means that they're kind of open minded and they're open to new ideas. Is that a difficult thing to swallow? Kind of higher up the chain for folks who are really just there to focus on the share price, focus on the performance, and and what do you do about that? 
Oh, it's great. Well, I love asking asking um, people on the top team. Um, so tell me about um, your early career. Okay. Um, and I say, so, yeah, and they do. And I say, so did you make any major mistakes then? Um, and of course, everybody says, yes, of course, I made loads of mistakes. Yes. Um, um, and, um, uh, and and so what was the learning around? Did, so, you, so you were in a high, were you in a high learning mode or a low learning mode? Oh, very much in a, in a high learning mode. Great. So you're making mistakes. In a high learning mode. Great. Um, what was the impact on the company of those mistakes you made? Hmm. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and then we say, okay, now let's go to the present. <laughs> What's the impact of the mistakes that you make now? Right. And how much of your how much of your time are you spending learning now? Right. Uh, right. And then then they begin to sometimes to get the message. Perfect. Perfect. Uh, by, by the way, something you said, and I can't remember the exact turn of phrase when you were talking, but you were, you were essentially saying, if you're not moving forward, you, you're moving backwards. And I'm paraphrasing heavily, but an old mentor of mine uh, had an expression which I think fits perfectly what you were trying or what you were, you were putting across. He said, if you're not green and growing, you're ripe and rotting. Uh, and I think that's essentially from uh, from what you're talking about the learning. I think it's uh, absolutely spot on for it. Um, uh, there's a, a second one I'd really love to ask you, and and I thought that one of the things that really jumped out at me. You said regard the naivete of uh, new people coming onto the team as an asset. How are you seeing people harnessing that? Because I say I'd say everybody on the call was nodding their heads, but I'm just wondering how how does somebody implement that or make it happen. Well, we've, for, for many years we've had this program, this project, we've had this process. Um, we, we call it banana memos um, after an experiment with with uh, with, with chimpanzees. I won't yeah. go into the long. I uh, remember that but, one. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Um, and and the, the point about the banana memo is that the, new, the the newcomer is tasked with actually finding um, um, things that you know, or, or raising questions. Why on earth do we do that? You know, my last company we did something different, and so forth. So looking, looking for the differences and, and, and questioning it. And, it's the, and then everybody else has to be able to, to really look at it and say, well, okay, it's a good question. Um, let's look at why we do that. Um, when did we last um, uh, examine that particular um, um, process or whatever um, to see if it was, it was, best, it was best practice? Uh, and it, it, so we're raising the questions. We're using that naivety and it lasts it really lasts more than three months before they go naked. Right. But right. while, it, while it, but those first those first few months, it's really valuable. And of course, there's, there, there's a kind of a tacit connection to what you were saying around psychological safety as well, isn't there? That, that openness to be able to uh, ask silly questions or make silly comments and, and not to feel that you're, you're likely to be victimized. So it's, it, everything seems to be connected to everything. Absolutely, yeah. So we, we're back. We, we, everything that we're finding now is is that if we're not thinking systemically, mm. uh, we, we 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 are basically creating more problems than we're solving. Right, right. Um, anything coming in? Any other questions coming in there, Kira? Yeah, we've got. I've got just got some more around um, frameworks to help organisations become learning organisations. David, do you have any kind of frameworks or resources to help organisations become those learning organisations, or any ideas or suggestions for that? Well, I, I think it's it's because this is a systemic issue. It, 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 there's so many a aspects to it, which while I've tried to reflect um, in in just a selection of of, of topics that, I, that I've I've covered. So it is all about it is all about diversity. It is about all about systems thinking, um, and uh, we we um, um, will be running for to celebrate my seventy fifth. I'm going off to Asia Pacific uh, Ooh, next month. Uh, I should be travelling around some of the islands and doing some pro bono um, um, work in, in, in the Pacific Islands and uh, having a having a ball. I hope, uh, <laughs> but. But while I'm there, I'm in, in the in the Asia Pacific time zone. So I'm going to be running um, um, a two day uh, intensive workshop virtually um, that put on, on all of these themes. So for anybody in those regions, um, you know, if you'd like to join that, 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 that will be uh, just, just uh, it's, and it's what we're doing is going to be doing it. each of these themes we talked about and say, OK, how can you do this? What is it specific to your organization to build a more 
And uh, what, what we'll do is, folks, if, uh, for any of you who are there, and I know there are several on there. In fact, David was asking a question uh, earlier on of, of David. Uh, uh, I know is based, I think, I think in Hong Kong, certainly out that yeah, direction. Yeah. But um, uh, so, folks, if anybody's interested in that, just, just pop it into the chat. And again, we'll get those details back to you. And what we'll do after the fact is we'll post in here uh, uh, some links up to, the, to that session that, that David is talking about. How in God's name, David, do you say sustain the energy to deliver a two-day intensive workshop virtually? Oh, it's hard, but you know, it, it's. I think it's 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 because it's fun. Um, ah. And the moment the moment things stop being fun, I'll I'll, I'll go retire. But um, I'm afraid um, this. I'm, I'm just having too much fun doing what I do, researching um, and, 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 and sharing the knowledge that we, that we get from, from, all, from all, all the research. Um, I, I, I typically say that uh, you know, uh, they will have to nail the lid on really hard when, I, when I'm dead. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, it actually really reminds me of, a, of a, a little piece of video that we shared a couple of months ago, David, uh, with that Irish guy who, who did the joke. He, he got a recording uh, of himself saying, let me out, let me out, put inside the box for when he was being very Absolutely. triggered by uh, uh, somebody else, so a real joker. So I can, I can kind of see you, I can say, kind of see you emulating him, uh, his example. Oh, but well, I think we're, we, we, go on. We, we already have it, we already have it planned. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, it's, but I'm not going to do the same thing because I, I, I had, I mean, I, I had had that idea a long time ago and then, then oh, wonderful to see somebody do it. And I, I'm yeah. always pleased with it. Yeah, but but actually, what the plan is that as as the coffin goes into the furnace um, and the doors open, um, there'll be a little video, <clears throat> and I'll come and say, so um, what you what you don't realise is that two weeks before I, before my death, I converted all my worldly wealth into notes, and they're in here with. <laughs> Here, here's a message for the family <laughs> but but certainly words to live by when it stops being fun i'll stop but be, be before we still have a couple of more minutes before we have to do a wrap up tell me kira any any other question there that uh, you'd like to serve up uh, just a lot of comments and a lot of um, a lot of thanks and agile is a mindset rather than structure the idea of a team development plan is really important and putting the responsibility of the individual development back into the hands of the individual is fabulous so I think it's really kind of hit um, home with people it's that missing piece isn't it that we haven't had previously that really makes sense as well so lots of comments like that coming in as well great thank you and um, David would you would you mind before before we, we finish off, because you, you touched on it in passing and I was going to mention it and then you very kindly offered if anybody wanted to try the, the survey, the political, the, the yes. politics survey. Can you just talk a little bit more about that? Uh, just what 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 is it? What would it do for folks? Just because we'll, we'll share out the link to that afterwards when we get it. Okay. Um, so we... Um we have we have we, we, it's part of a part of a major project we're running a book on coaching in a politicized environment um, and so we're looking at various aspects of of, of, of politics with a small piece uh, and so one of the things that we found we need was some way of, of somebody looking at themselves and saying am I looking at politics in the right way um, um, because politics actually is pretty neutral but we many people look at it as they they literally the music or, or in an abusive way, or they see it as something horrible. That you, should, you, know, you, you don't get involved in politics. But actually, politics is about relationship building and, and managing relationships. And so what, we, what we're trying to do is to, see, is to help people get a balanced view or test your know, balance their view is of politics. Um, and, and, and then, obviously, the implication of that, that the more, the more that you can be politically effective but without being, politic, but being political, you can, um, your, uh, you can the, the best, the more effective you can be in your job role as a leader. Uh, so we, we've not yet put this up on, um, on, on a survey monkey or, or any of those things. We, 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 we're just putting it out as a, as a questionnaire for people to complete and say, give us your feedback, basically. Uh, but so far, we've, we've had um, a, a lot of really positive feedback. It seems to give people a sense of, okay, now I see where I am. Maybe I could do, there are some things I could do that would actually make me uh, more aware yeah. um, of, what, of, of, when, of, when, of what's happening around me from a, 
you know, am I am I being maneuvered by people, other people being political? For example, okay, so if you are, what do you do about it? And that's some of the things we'll be addressing in the book, book at last. Great, thank thank you, David. I, I I I'm just using on the fact that I I bet people anybody who joined the session this morning I bet they 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 are really glad they joined because uh, one uh, for anybody who hasn't written the first book yet or is struggling to write the second one, uh, David offered an ebook on how to write your first book, and we as I say we post up the details of of how you can uh, sign up for that with David afterwards, and uh, then the opportunity to try that um, uh, organizational politics. Uh, uh, survey and then for those of you who are in Asia Pacific we'll get you the details on that two-day workshop uh, or uh, that that sounds absolutely fascinating uh, besides anything I'd love to be on it just to watch just just to learn how do you do that and how do you sustain the energy but uh, David it's it's always 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 a joy and really really appreciate your time um, I, if you're not rushing off I hope you can hold, hold a uh, hang around behind the scenes so we can formally thank you but on behalf of everybody here uh, as ever fantastic tremendously uh, useful stuff thank you so much it's a pleasure take care Okay, folks, so let me go back to here. That's not where I wanted to go at all. Here's where I wanted to go. And I'm hoping that I'm going to focus in at some stage. There we go. Um, so uh, we, we'll be back to you um, in the, the chat underneath this, and we may post it up with some of the resources that David very, very kindly promised. And uh, if you are a coach, or if you're a leader who is uh, uh, interested in taking a coaching uh, approach with your team, absolutely fascinating book that you're seeing here in the background. As I say, it's tremendous value on Kindle. I couldn't believe it at 4.95. Um, next week we have Dr. Amanda Blake, or Mandy as she she calls herself, and we'll call herself to you uh, on the session. And this this is a uh, a really fascinating topic, and uh, I I think you'll really enjoy it. And as I say, she's going to for people who come along. She's going to be providing with, a, uh, with an access to a, a seven-day program uh, free of charge. So with that said, um, let me thank you for being here, taking the time. Let me thank the folks who put the questions in. Let me thank Kira for stepping into the breach um, with uh, AFA away and doing such a great job managing the questions with you guys. And um, we look forward to seeing you. Uh, next week. I was going to say same time, same channel, but I just want to double check. It's actually not. It's at 2 p.m. UK time uh, because Amanda is uh, based on the uh, east coast of the United States, but really, really worthwhile session. So wishing you all the very best for a great week. Take care of yourself.